Yeah. Right, so I've obviously got the graveyard shift, so I'll be as quick as I can. But um, <laughs> uh, yeah, my name's Nick Crabb, and I'm from the University of Brighton. I'm a final year PhD student. I'm actually due to submit my thesis next month, so this has provided quite a welcome distraction from getting on with that. Um, today I wanted to speak about, well, most of my research has been applying different remote sensing technologies within alluvial environments, but today I wanted to speak about how we can use um, UAS mounted multispectral sensors for archaeological inspection and landscape modelling. And the, I'll, I'll start by sort of giving a relatively detailed um, overview of some considerations for their effective use and then provide some um, smaller case studies to illustrate the main benefits of this technology. Uh, I don't think this works, but I'll hold on to it. Um, so I wanted to sort of briefly introduce what multispectral data actually provides in some more detail. Um, we've seen some really great examples of it already today, but um, essentially where aerial photography is sensitive to a broad spectral range cover, covering the visible part of the EM spectrum, Multispectral sensors co-collect imagery from different wavelengths over the visible and near-infrared region. And because these are passive sensors, they, message, um, they measure proportions of reflected, absorbed, and transmitted energy in, in certain wavelengths, which vary according to plant health. And this relationship, according to plant health, has enabled um, many applications within sort of precision agriculture to sort of monitor the condition of crops. Um, but as archaeological features obviously alter the chemical and physical um, properties of the soil matrix, they're often expressed as phenological differences identifiable in multispectral data. So we can use this to identify archaeological features. Essentially. Um, the way in which multispectral imagery quantifies vegetation health is by measuring the proportion of incident energy reflected in different wavelengths, which is otherwise known as spectral reflectance. In the visible, ref um, in visible wavelengths, incident radiation is absorbed by chlorophyll content in plants to a greater extent principally in the uh, blue and red regions, as you can see in this um, spectral profile of different uh, ground surface characteristics. Um, if a plant becomes subject to stress, there'll be a decrease in chlorophyll production, resulting in the yellowing of a plant, which causes um, increased reflectance. Whereas in the near-infrared part of the spectrum, vegetation typically re reflects around 40 to 50% of the energy, energy incident upon it, and then a decrease in reflectance occurs. But significantly, this decrease in reflectance isn't related to the chlorophyll content of plants, but to the internal structure of the plants due to the longer wavelength of um, near-infrared bands. Um, and this really relates to the internal structure of the plant, otherwise known as the mesophyll. And because um, stress in vegetation is apparent in, in the internal structure of the plant earlier than in the, in the um, chlorophyll production, you can use near-infrared imagery to essentially identify variations in plant stress I, earlier and more clearly within the, than within visible wavelengths. So theoretically, crop marks associated with archaeological features should be more clearly, clearly identifiable. Um, the use of multispectral imagery in archaeology is not new, and there's been nearly 40 years of um, satellite and airborne multispectral um, data sets that have shown significant potential. But this has been sort of hindered by the high cost of systems that provide a suitable spatial resolution, and, and that's been a real barrier to its wider use. However, more recently, the development of um, UAS-mounted multispectral symptoms have now enable very high spatial resolutions to be collected. And there's a whole bunch of instruments of it now available, which I've sort of clustered here. Um, <laughs> but, and all of these have really been produced by developments in precision agriculture, as we've already discussed earlier today. Um, the, their relatively low cost and increased flexibility is a significant advantage over other platforms. And there has been numerous applications of this in recent years, and there's a whole bunch of references which I've provided at the end, but I won't go into too much depth with that. Slightly problematically, the application of multispectral imagery does require some considerable sort of um, consideration of, what, uh, of how best to use it, essentially. And the capability of any multispectral imagery and most remote sensing data sets is sort of dependent upon the re resolving characteristics of each sensor. So, this is governed by four key attributes. Spatial um, resolution, which is the amount of ground surface area recorded, which we've discussed extensively today in terms of topographic data sets. Spectral resolution, which is the number of wave bands and portions of the EM spectrum that are sampled. Um, and radiometric resolution, which is the number of tonal intensities that an, a sensor can distinguish. Um, but it is also one of the most key, um, important parameters is temporal resolution, which is the timing and frequency of lighting data, um, collecting data sets. As multispectral um, or as UAS mounted multispectral data sets typically provide very high um, 
radiometric and, and uh, spatial resolutions, it's really these, the spectral resolution and the temporal resolution that we, we're most concerned with in terms of trying to identify sort of optimal periods and optimal wavelengths in which we're, we can use this technology to identify archaeological features. Um, where most satellite uh, multispectrals provide a small number of relatively broad bands covering the EM spectrum, hyperspectral systems provide hundreds of contiguous bands that can allow for the analysis of the structure and, and, and biochemistry and physiology of plants. So you can use, you know, using these full spectral profiles of different surfaces, you can look at plant disease and so on. And it's been used very widely in, in precision agriculture, but has yet to be really fully exploited for archaeological purposes. Um, most US multispectral sensors are targeted upon really narrow bands of the EM spectrum at the peaks and troughs of these vegetation reflectance curves. So for example, this parrot sequoia sensor, which is the one I've mostly been using, um, which provides four bands that covering the red, green, red edge, and near infrared um, parts of the spectrum, are really targeted upon these areas of the spectrum where contrast of vegetation health is, is likely to be most evident. Um, and this obviously potentially allows for the identification of more subtle features which are uh, expressed in different regions of the EM spectrum, but also um, can sort of enhance contrast to these features. Um, but as I say, the timing of data acquisition is, is, is of key importance, and it's obviously been widely recognized that archaeological features vary significantly in terms of their visibility across the year. And although multispectral data extends the period in which they will be most apparent, Features will still be better expressed during certain times of the year, and normally in relation to periods of drought and plant senescence and so on. And obviously it can be very difficult to predict when these, um, these periods of optimal visualization occur, mostly due to local environmental and climatic conditions. And as a result, it's really beneficial to collect high temporal resolution data sets, that, by which I mean repeat survey data sets, but that's not often always very feasible particularly within a commercial setting where you may only get sort of one shot to go and collect some data. And as a result, it's kind of essential to try and identify periods when the collection of multispectral is likely to be most effective. One way in which we can do this is by monitoring um, rainfall rates and soil moisture, soil moisture deficit, which is used in um, agriculture and meteorological studies to indicate the amount of um, moisture needed to bring the soil back to capacity. Um, can, it's long been recognized that consecutive periods of high soil moisture deficit or dry periods enable crop marks to be more clearly visible. And we can download um, mon monthly water situation reports that can, um, as open government data, which enable us to identify optimal conditions. And they typically provide these sort of uh, plots of the UK with red areas, say, basically being dry for longer periods and blue areas being wetter. Um, and we can also use rainfall, rainfall rates to identify drier periods. Um, and this typically t sort of seems to occur around um, late May in the UK, um, where you get these dry periods. Um, but obviously this is not only influenced by rainfall and moisture, but um, also by ground surface conditions. In the UK, um, most of the countryside is covered by open pasture and arable crops. Grass is typically less responsive to the presence of archaeological features due to its shallower root depth. But more closely spaced crops with deep roots such as wheat and barley provide a, a better surface contrast of archaeological features. In particular, the boot stage of the wheat crop cycle is, is, has been shown to be most sensitive to these variations in the subsurface, which in the UK is around sort of late May, again coinciding with these dry periods. Um, so you can see how you can try to sort of optimise or identify periods when you know, we should see the crop marks more visibly, but this is obviously highly dependent on a lot of other conditions, including the type of soil and um, geology present on any site. For example, most clay sites are obviously well known to be relatively poor for um, crop marks, but, but they can be observed in some conditions. So despite all of these sort of complexities in trying to optimize the survey conditions in which we collect multispectral data, they can provide a really cost-effective and rapid assessment of archaeological features that are expressed as surface variations in vegetation health. Um, perhaps, yeah, arguably, they're probably best used to complement um, other conventional data sets. And, um, they obviously, but they can lead to the enhancement of the presence of known um, subsurface features. They probably shouldn't be seen as a sort of replacement for other um, techniques such as geophysical survey, which will sort of provide another level of detail in, in a different way. But they can still be used in this sort of complementary manner. And I wanted to just focus on three small case studies 
um, from, from a variety of locations in the UK, which I've collected using the, the Parrot Sequoia sensor mounted on this um, SenseFly EB drone, which is a fixed wing system. And the key advantage of that is it, it allows for sort of longer flight time. So you can sort of fly for around 50 minutes rather than in shorter intervals. Um, but, you know, it's just a platform to carrying the thing rather than anything else. Um, so the first site I wanted to talk about is um, Kingston Down in South Dorset, which is a scheduled prehistoric and rural British settlement with an associated field system. The features primarily consist of, a dent of um, coaxial linear features with evidence for trackways and hut circles and, and some turf covered banks. The survey was deployed here to try and identify whether any potentially ploughed down remains were located beyond the extent of this um, scheduled boundary over an area of comprising um, arable and open pasture. I'll just have a drink and then carry on. Um, so the data in this um, image is just presented as a false colour composite, which just very simply combines near infrared, red and green bands as a composite image. So most RGB images are obviously just with red, green and blue, but this incorporates the near infrared band. Um, as you can see, a number of um, linear features as well as bit light features have been identified. Um, and the idea was really to sort of see if any of these um, field boundaries are continued further to the north, um, which are highlighted by these purple lines, which are the uh, recorded um, features from aerial mapping. But as you can see, a number of additional features were identified in the red, many of which were sort of correlated to internal divisions within the known, feature, um, within the known field enclosures. In addition, some other additional sort of pit like and um, settlement type features were also identified. Um, further to the north, um, within that little box, um, within the wheat fields, um, a series of other linear features were identified and some possible evidence for ridge and furrow, um, which did not conform to the orientation of the, the predominant sort of alignment of features, which likely indicates that they're probably, you know, later uh, agricultural activity, but significantly we identified less sort of um, evidence for many of these field system features. So you could see how multispectral data sort of enables an enhancement of our understanding of where we are identifying archaeological features. Uh, this, the last site, not the last, the second site I wanted to talk about is um, Holmmoor and Dartmoor, which is a relatively well-preserved part of the Dartmoor Reeve system. Features on this site generally consist of um, banks of earth and stone, with often with associated ring cairns and other monuments dated from the Bronze Age. In this case, the survey aimed to characterise known many of the known features, but also I tried to identify any new features, and the data was obviously collected over this sort of grass moorland landscape but there were many exposed granite banks and cairns visible on the surface. So the data in this um, image is just presented as an NDVI, which we've already heard about really nicely from Scott. There's obviously a whole wide range of different um, vegetation indices that we can use, and they will uh, enhance these different characteristics as Scott really nicely portrayed. But in this case, um, the NDVI en enables a really clear differentiation between um, areas of green, healthier vegetation and areas of sort of less healthy vegetation and um, exposed stone. Um, so when we look at some of the part of the reef system, you can see that some of the areas of um, better vegetation health represent these kind of ditch-like features, but you also get this recording of the stone banks, which is quite easily differentiated by using these spectral properties. Similarly, within the ring cairn features, ind each individual stone within the within the exposed or the exposed surface stones that can be recorded through multispectral data. Um, just to give a sort of perspective how that looks on the ground, you can see, you know, they, they're obviously very easy to spot on the surface, but multispectral data enables quite a large scale coverage um, and recording of these differences. So you could sort of map these detailed features. Although this could obviously be significantly enhanced by Earthwork Survey and other things, it gives you another tool to try and identify these things. And in particular, some of these um, exposed stones may not necessarily have any topographic expression as such, but they will still be identifiable as a, as a spectral response. Um, <clears throat> in addition, down in the south of the site where there were some um, further ring cairns, numerous further additional circular features were also identified. Hopefully you can see some of them. There's a, one nice clear one there, but there's a, you know, you could sort of could let your eye draw several more. Um, and again, I, I, what I'm trying to illustrate is that 
you know, multispectral data can enable an enhancement of the known archaeological record by sort of um, giving you something else to look at. Thank you. That's great. Um, so the last case study that I wanted to talk about is from my PhD research um, in the Lower Lug Valley in Herefordshire. Um, and the Lower Lug Valley occupies a relatively broad portion of floodplain with up to th or three metres of Holocene, Hol Holocene alluvium overlying much of the archaeology. Um, <clears throat> as a result, most sort of conventional prospection methods such as geophysical survey and um, uh, aerial photography are generally quite ineffective. And trial trenching can obviously also be quite uh, challenging due to the extent of alluvial overburden. Um, despite this, when archaeological investigations have taken place within the floodplain ahead of sand and gravel extraction, a significant multi-period multi archaeological remains and organic rich um, sediments deposited within paleogels have been located. One of the key aspects of this is that when most of the archaeology is, tends to be focused on the higher drier areas of the floodplain that are intersected by paleo channels. Um, whereas the lower lying wetter areas of the floodplain tend to be better for preserving more um, better preserved paleoenvironmental assemblages. So we can use these kind of um, alluvial landforms to make predictions regarding the distribution of archaeological resources. Um, as a result, the multispectral survey in this case was trying to identify alluvial landforms um, to try and make predictions regarding archaeological potential. Um, <clears throat> this particular survey site was located over a Neolithic standing stone, which is a scheduled monument. The scheduled monument boundary is actually just the four corners of this weird fence that the farmers put in. Um, but it's like kind of located on this um, slight rise within the floodplain. So it's quite an interesting area, although there's a sort of documentary evidence to suggest it's not in its primary in situ location. So it's a slightly curious monument, but um, I wanted to try and uh, improve the understanding of its landscape setting. Um, in this case, again, I presented the data just as a false colour composite, but you can see how um, many alluvial landforms are visible as these variations in vegetation health. So you get these sort of lower topographic zones, as I've defined them, um, relating to areas of poor vegetation health, which are these sort of turquoisey bits. Um, some of these relate to very clear meander loops and paleo channels, whereas others sort of relate to these <coughs> just sort of lower lying, wetter areas. But these areas are significantly more likely to contain paleo-environmental assemblages, but perhaps less likely to contain specific archaeological features. In addition, on the western side of the river, um, you, within the sort of grass pasture area, I, there was a slight area of a healthier vegetation, which appeared to relate to this slight rise in topography that we identified in the LIDAR data. And significantly, um, that sort of enabled this definition of a higher topographic zone, which is more likely to contain specific archaeological evidence. And when um, archaeological excavations have taken place further up the floodplain, most of the archaeological activities appears to be located primarily within these sort of landforms. So using multispectral data to try and model the, land, uh, the landscape to try and make predictions of um, these, where the distribution of archaeological resources can also be extremely beneficial. So just to conclude, um, what I've sort of tried to emphasize is there's obviously quite a lot of complexity surrounding the effective collection of multispectral data sets. I've tried most of, um, it seems that m around sort of late May seems to be the best time to collect some multispectral data, but this can be quite variable across the year. Significantly, this isn't always, doesn't always marry up with other data sets. So the collection of multispectral data set doesn't really collecting at the same time as LIDAR data sets might not be very effective because in LIDAR data sets you might want to have minimal vegetation well as really in multispectral data sets you want to see plant stress so collecting the two at the same time might not be the best way to go about it um, however the narrow bands provided by US multispectral, multispectral systems do help to maximize the potential de um, detection of subsurface features that are expressed as vegetation um, health variations they also offer an increased flexibility in terms of data collection, but it can be difficult to predict. And therefore, using multispectral data in conjunction with other techniques is obviously more likely to offer the, um, the, um, the best result. And everyone seems to have emphasized this sort of need to do <laughs> um, ground-based kind of observations as well. And I think that is really a key theme throughout today. So, I mean, that's more or less what I'm suggesting as well. But, um, <laughs> but I think, uh, one of the ways in which multispectral data can particularly add value is in areas where other techniques are less likely to succeed. So 
where geophysical survey may not particularly be beneficial in alluvial environments, for example, or in areas where granite is the predominant geology, where those techniques aren't necessarily going to be the best. It can add significant value. Um, but ultimately, further research is still required to kind of explore the full potential of these systems, as well as other systems such as hyperspectral data, which are sort of continually being developed through precision agriculture. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.